Good afternoon, this is Roy Oppenheim at Zoom at noon. I can't believe it, but this is the fifth week that we are holding these sessions. Uh, for those of you who haven't participated before, and I know there's some of you who haven't, the purpose of this is to give you information, strength, and knowledge so you can get through the present, understand how we got here, and more importantly, uh, where we're going in the future. This is kind of an interactive process, so we're, we're asking you to ask questions. We will take your questions either through or, or towards the end, and it's supposed to be uh, somewhat educational, but at the same time provocative in terms of helping you get through this in a way that we can figure out where we're going. Because we are going to get through this, and the question is, who are going to be the winners, who are going to be the losers, and how to make sure we get out of this safely and in such a way that we can prosper uh, long term as a society and as a family and as individuals. So today's topic is waiting for SBA funding, PPP, practical, pertinent, proactive legal tips for you and your business. As it relates to, to legal tips throughout the process, we'll be talking about how lawyers and the legal system come into play, how they are participating in the process and how in some ways we, we have to do workarounds. You know, for example, how do you have a jury trial right now uh, during, during this, this uh, pandemic? And the answer is that you don't. And, and there are constitutional issues associated with that. How do people have, have a trial, even a civil trial among their peers when you can't have a group of people sitting in a jury box right now? These are the kinds of issues that, that we are all going to have to address as a society. So for purposes of the table of contents, uh, we're going to go over weekly unemployment for, and the first signs of impact. Second, the update of, of federal aid, PPP loans, and the individual benefits. And then PPP community level. PPP here is being, of course, used not in terms of the loans, but in terms of practical, pertinent, and proactive legal tips. Again, commercial large scale, small businesses, individuals, and of course, creativity and ingenuity and how we get out of this in the future. For those of you who are not familiar with our firm, we were founded in 1989. Ellen Polelski, my partner, and I founded the firm. Jeff Sherman is a partner. We have two other associates, uh, Mia Singh and Paola. Uh, Paola's last name is um, Greg, Greg, okay. Greg, I'm, I'm having, okay. Vergara, Paola Vergara. And Paola uh, today was responsible for uh, helping put this presentation together. And uh, so uh, was my, our son, Lance Oppenheim, who are very helpful for, for having done that. Uh, Wayne Patton is also of counsel of the firm, and, and he's working with us on trust and estate matters. Uh, the firm historically had been involved with uh, representing people in foreclosure during the last economic crisis. And uh, we are shocked, and as, as, as is everyone else, that we are back in the same position where we'll be helping people try to stay in their homes and fend off uh, their their issues that they're going to have. For the time being, however, uh, those problems are gonna come later, and so we need to talk about what the issues are at hand. Last time around, our last discussion was about the consequences of, of COVID-19 and the pandemic on, econo and on the economic sectors. This week, we're discussing how to rapidly adapt and survive in the months to come. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, what black swan events are, because we're dealing here with a historical event that really is not something that any of us have ever dealt with before. Some people said like 9-11, some people saying it's like the economic crisis that, that we had just 12 years ago, but it really is something much, much greater than that. And a lot of analysts are suggesting that we look all the way back to the Black Plague or that we look to the Great Depression. And in terms of the Black Plague, uh, a lot of things changed after the plague. Obviously lots of people died, but what also happened was that major, political and, and, and economic structures changed in such a way that society changed on a going forward basis. Uh, one of the big differences that, that occurred is that the feudal system fell apart. Many people were able to start getting types of jobs that paid higher wages. And more interestingly, lots of prices on certain commodities and products dropped precipitously. And we're gonna see that happen here. For example, the price of oil is dropping and, and it, it's unclear when, when that will, will, will improve. During the Great Depression, people started to save a ton more money after the Depression, and we expect to see savings rates also continue to increase. Of course, Social Security was created, and we had the kinds of, of systems put in place that are now being doubled and tripled down during this economic crisis. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the weekly unemployment data because this kind of tells you exactly where we are, and it suggests graphically how different things are this time than they have been in the past. 
for example, we have probably over 17 million people that have now applied for unemployment. We, three that we see the three orange sticks at the end that are showing what the weekly unemployment rate, uh, un unemployment claims have been. We compare that to 08 and 09, and it's something that you can't even comprehend. It's not something that you can even suggest is something similar in, in nature. And it's because of that that we have to talk about this as an existential threat to our community, our small businesses, and to the kind of life that we've previously been accustomed to. Next slide, please. Actually, we have, we have a question. I guess our first question is going to be uh, a poll question that we'd all like you to ask. How many of you have uh, filed for unemployment? Uh, and then the question is, is the first question. And if you can answer that, that would be great. And if you haven't filed for, and if you have filed for unemployment, how many of you have actually received unemployment? So on this call, there are really very only a few percentage, only about 7% who've, who've applied for unemployment. And then now the question is, how many of you have actually received the unemployment? And the answer is probably not going to be very high on, on, on that question. Can we go to the, the, the second part? Okay. If you have filed for unemployment, uh, have you received it? Almost, almost no one has received it. And that's part of the problem here is that the safety net could be working and could infuse cash into the economy if the money was getting to people? And the answer is right now, but unfortunately it currently still is not getting to people. The other thing is that we had thought that this was, could be a comparable event to something that we could look to from post 9-11 or the Great Recession, but it's an exogenous event that has caused the economy to collapse, very similar to Katrina in 2005, which actually in some ways triggered the, the recession, but it was only a recession and we all got out of it and it didn't affect everyone equally. And, and this one, seems to be affecting everyone, regardless of, of, of who you are or where you might be. Next slide. Weekly, okay, uh, want to go over the, the next slide here if we can. Uh, the virus has shown a world vulnerable to fear of illness. We have yet to experience its vulnerability to the economic consequences of that fear. And I, and I want to talk a little bit about that. For example, in China, where part of the world is starting to reopen, you have Shanghai Disney, and it's a place that people are supposed to go and bring your children and have lots of fun. Well, while it has technically opened, there are restrictions on how many people can come. Everyone has to wear a face mask. Everyone's temperature has to be taken. And you also have to show a QR code on your phone to show that, that you do have the antibodies in order to be admitted. You have to wear a face mask the entire time, and the only time you get to take your face mask off is when you are having a meal. I'm not sure how much fun that's going to be, but I guess we will redefine our, our definition of fun. And, and of course, uh, what's going to happen is as we get back into opening our society, it's going to be somewhat dystopian and somewhat different because those kinds of restrictions are gonna be imposed on us and we're all not gonna be accustomed to that because it is a change in the nature of the way we respond to government and the community and it's gonna change effectively our civil liberties. Uh, next question. Um, once the shelter in place ends, how long do you think social distancing will impact our way of life and the economy? Okay, um, I'm not sure if everyone gets to see these results, but everyone is suggesting that social distancing is going to last anywhere between a quarter of saying three to six months, six to 12 months is about what half the folks are saying, one to two years, 21%, and some people 10% are suggesting over two years. It's of course going to be a question of whether or not we're all going to get the antibodies one way or the other, or whether there's going to be a vaccine, and as we talked about last week, or are there going to be palliative medicines that, that can be used to treat the, 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 the disease in such a way that we can go on with our life and that it won't be as destructive. Either way, these all are going to take time, and until that happens, while the economy may roll open in, in parts, it will not be business as we were once accustomed to in the past. Thank you. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about what kinds of businesses and sectors are, are doing and how they're doing and how that will impact what's going to go on in, in the future for us. Uh, as we can see in this particular slide, uh, groceries are, people are spending obviously more on groceries. They're spending a lot less on health and beauty, but of course they're spending the least on travel and, and shopping has dropped off, although online shopping has, has done, done okay. I'm going to catch up here. Thank you. I uh, want to talk about the next question, and, and, and that is, 
what sectors you all think will come back first and, and how, and we have a choice here. And that is, um, based upon your current trends, which part of the economy do you think will come back first? And the answers are gyms, home improvements, hotels, or food or delivery. And what we're seeing here is that food delivery obviously is coming, is, it looks like it's gonna come back faster than anything. Hotels is clearly the lowest. Home improvements is uh, third last and, and then gyms in the middle. So ho hotels are the worst and food delivery is high. So I wanna mention one thing about hotels. We, we're seeing a number of vulture funds that are being created right now to pick up distressed hotel properties. And the anticipation is that those properties uh, will come on the market probably in nine to 12 months. Uh, when there, people are able to go back, but you don't have the large conventions, you have restrictions on how many people can be in one place at one time, and then subsequently uh, the hotels are going to suffer because there'll also be less people who are traveling for, com for large conferences. And so you're going to see some repositioning of these kinds of properties, but, but that's an example of one sector that, that may not come back the way it, it once was. Uh, next slide, please, 11. Uh, this is a slide of, of showing uh, what areas and what sectors are, are currently doing okay and which ones are doing terribly. And it's an indication of what will do better and worse in the future. Obviously, we're seeing uh, at, at the far right that online grocers and, and gaming are doing great. Uh, video streaming, of course, meal kits, food delivery, everything that we all anticipate. Alcohol seems to be doing okay. It always does well, rain or shine. And on the, and on the worst side, uh, we see airlines, movie theaters, lodging and cruises and fitness uh, all not doing particularly well, and, and that may be the case uh, when social distancing can, continues. Grocery sales are way up as people cook at home. Warehouse clubs doing okay, but alcohol, again, meat, meal kits, and online grocers doing the best. Spending on travel has slumped. Airlines down, lodging down, cruise lines down, online travel agencies, rental cars all down. Restaurant sales, terrible. Fine dining, we, we weren't sure about this, but we were speculating that fine dining would do worse than fast food. In fact, that's the case because you need, uh, in, in fine dining, there, there typically is not the social spacing that you have with fast food, which is usually takeout in the first place. Fast casual and between casual dining, similar issues to fine dining, but fast food will probably not be as bad as, as the other sectors in the restaurant business, but delivery services clearly will, will be the best. And restaurants will have to recalibrate how they, they have a back kitchen for delivery services and how they're gonna space uh, people out if they're going to actually eat in. Uh, spending on media and entertainment is mixed. Main losers, few winners. We look at the winners at the bottom. Ebooks, I thought people would be reading more, but certainly it looks like music streaming is doing okay. Video streaming, of course, and gaming uh, takes the top, top dog. And the reason for that, by the way, is because you probably get the biggest bang for your buck on a game, and that a game isn't just like one movie uh, that you may rent. But of course, with video streaming, you have these massive libraries. But I guess gaming is interactive as, as opposed to the passive of, of just video streaming. But in terms of, of what's... Uh, not doing particularly well. Movie theaters are all closed. Events and attractions we talked about last week, the likelihood is that that's going to change. Toys, you would think, would, would be doing well. I'm not sure why they're not, uh, and that's kind of interesting. Uh, but you can study this later also. Shopping is down overall, uh, particularly for brick and mortar stores. We see here that discount stores, dep department stores are doing the worst. Electronics at the bottom, doing the least worst. Activewear, people are working out at home. Luxury department stores are probably doing okay online. People still want to want to buy stuff. And uh, footwear, people really aren't going very far, so they're, they're not buying as, as, as much uh, shoes as they were in, in the past. Um, but all this is suggesting that, that even when the economy comes back, certain things are going to be in and some things are going to be out, out. on transportation. Scooter shares are, 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 are non-existent. Taxis are virtually non-existent. Mass transit, very low. Parking, not doing too well. Auto parts, auto sales, I guess people are deciding they might as well get a new car. Auto parts, a lot of people are, are, are probably re, redoing their own cars on, on their own. On health, paradoxically, has fallen. Spending on health has fallen. Um, a lot of people are not going to the doctor. They're using telehealth, which we'll talk about a little bit more. Uh, but also fitness and beauty and all, all those sectors are, are not doing well because of the close proximity and, and, and the inability to, to do these things uh, without the proper social distancing. Let me catch up. Okay, let's let's talk about some government programs here. You know, last time around, I, I had told people 12 years ago that they shouldn't wait for the cavalry and that the government wasn't going to come. 
And it took months and months before government programs really started to roll out. This time the government seemed to want to do the right thing and they announced this idle program, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan. And during our first seminars, we had told people that they, if they had a business, they ought to apply for it. And you could, you would get a minimum of ten thousand dollars, of which the first ten thousand was going to be a grant, and it would, and you could get up to a two million dollar loan. Well, as as luck would have it, or as as the situation has it, is the program now has just been stuck, and the biggest grant you can get is fifteen thousand, uh, and the ten thousand dollar grants have 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 dried up. I don't know almost anyone who has received them. The $2 million promise cap is gone. The government said that they should not have, have suggested that. It was a mistake, and that's not happening. Uh, very few people have gotten this loan or, or grant, and anyone who's expecting it, I'm afraid, should, should not count on it. Um, you probably should not hold your breath. Um, the lesson here is, of course, that the cash is still king, and, and, and you need to be very cautious about your cash and how you spend it and, and which, and which uh, creditors you pay at, at this time. Thanks. Um, uh, we, have, we have question four here. Thank you. Okay. Uh, question four, the idle. If you've applied for the economic injury disaster loan, which is called the idle, uh, and if so, have you received funding? So have you applied for it? Uh, and if so, have you received funding? Okay, so we have a lot of people who applied for it. Close to half of the folks here today have, have applied for it, over half. Uh, yes, I've applied. Okay. There's 2% who have applied and received funding. Congratulations to you. You should win a prize of some sort. Everyone else has applied, uh, and or, or half, a third have applied, and a third have, have, have applied and have not received it. So 66% applied and have not received it, 2% applied and received it, and 34% have not applied. So it, it's, it's just not a, a, a successful program. The problem, of course, is that the government uh, hasn't set up the infrastructure that's necessary with the banks to process the documentation. Uh, things are a little different uh, as it relates to the PPP, the, the Payment Protection Plan, but they're not that much better, actually. Um, many banks have suspended applications. Uh, they're overloaded. They, they, uh, Bank of America took 315,000 applications in the first week. Uh, there have been already 580,000 loan requests made. Apparently over half, $151 billion has already been committed uh, to the loans. Uh, many banks are, are just overwhelmed. I know Wells Fargo is, is having a huge problem with, with getting their, their, their applications through. And I suspect that by the end of the week, the full $350 million that has been committed uh, by the government to this program will, will be exhausted. And I know there's a $250 billion request to expand the program, and that is currently stuck in committee. Uh, I do want to reiterate, and I mentioned this last week, that 1099s uh, will not be uh, covered in the, uh, in, in the repayment of forgiveness. So these loans can be turned into grants and you don't have to repay the loan. But unfortunately, if you only hire 1099s, like you're a general contractor and you have a bunch of subs, the loans that you use to pay your subs would have to be repaid. Um, and then the question is, are you still planning to apply for the PPP? The question is, how many of you are still planning? Because if you are, I would ask you that when you get off of this call that you Treat this as the most important thing you do today, because by the end of the week, the program will effectively be shut until it is refunded. So we have 57% that say they still plan on applying, 44% they do not. So those of you uh, who think they're going to apply ought, ought to do so as soon as possible. Now, the problem is that the, the, the loans were first prioritized to those people who were with banks that previously had an SBA loan out there. That was the first group. The second group was folks who had a banking relationship, meaning that they had both a banking a bank account and maybe an outstanding mortgage or some other kind of line of credit that the bank uh, knew, you, knew who you were. The banks are not eager to be making loans to third parties who they don't have a previously strong relationship with because they're afraid that if there's fraud, that at the end of the day, the SBA who has guaranteed the loans will look back to the banks and say that the banks did not do their due diligence on their homework. So they want to go first with the customers that they had strong relationships with, who they knew, who they understood, who they already had documentation with, and all they really had to do was get updated documentation. 
Uh, there are ways to go to new banks, but it's going to be tough. And I think you really almost have to go through the SBA. And by the time you do that, I'm afraid that we'll probably be, be out of time. Um, next page. Oh, page 20 here. Uh, the other thing is individual benefits and updates. Uh, supposedly the checks in the mail, we've heard that before, the $1,200 check for individuals and $500 per child. For those of you who haven't filed tax returns because you don't have to, there is a way to file a free bare bones tax return that will then make you eligible for the stimulus. This is important for retired workers and veterans who, who uh, do not receive benefits from the federal government as well as for low income families. So it's very important that, that you all understand how, how these procedures work so we can get you that money as soon as possible. Um, Rock Creek Group Investments said that our economy is very strong, our social fabric was not. That is why the economic impact of the pandemic, pandemic is unevenly distributed. It may be unevenly distributed, but it's still affecting everyone in different ways, just like the uh, Great Depression did and just like the Black Plague did. Uh, let's talk a little bit about what's going on in Asia again, because there, there is a glimpse of, of what is, is going on in terms of a rolling out of, of, of the economy. Uh, monthly sales are coming back, but they're only at 50%. In most companies, if their sales were only at 50%, they probably would not be able to meet payroll, pay their rent, and pay their taxes. But at least they have some modicum of, of a business that, that, that could flourish over, over the next few months or years. People are venturing out, out in masks. They're going out with precaution, with restrictions. And um, the amount of people that can congregate in a in, in, in terms of any particular place, whether it's a, an event or, or, or a conference, is very limited. And so large numbers of people are not permitted to gather. Uh, restaurants, theaters, and other personal and uh, types of live entertainment service providers will have to block space between people to maintain their social distance. And so it's going to be interesting to see how we're going to be able to continue to have movie theaters as well as venues for live performances, or if we're just going to allow less people in and, and make sure that they're spaced out much further. Uh, the remote work experiment has shown that the companies probably do not need as much office space as they previously had. And that's something that, that is not going to change as we bounce back from, from this crisis. In terms of, of the post-coronavirus communities, communities will have to grapple with the relationship between government, private entities, and the market in connection with public goods such as education, healthcare, and access technology. As I also said, this is also going to affect our legal system and how our legal system relates to uh, its constituents, the public, the judges, as well as, of course, lawyers, and, and more importantly, the jurors. And, uh, and that's a, a problem that, that we're going to just have to continue to work with. The idea of remote uh, hearings, which is what lawyers are going through right now, is probably something that's going to be more common than uh, having to wait hours uh, for a hearing in, in a courtroom and drive down there and spend a lot of time, wasted time arguably, uh, for the five or 10 minutes or half hour that you're going to appear before the court. So, so this may, may require courts and judges and, and the legal system to become a lot more efficient in dispensing with, with judicial resources. In terms of health coverage, the pandemic has showed that our healthcare system is as strong as its weakest link on the chain. And, and our weakest link obviously is not having enough protective gear for, for the, uh, the folks who are on the, on the front lines, the doctors and the nurses and the paramedics, um, and, th and that becomes our weakest link. And of course, uh, not having the proper equipment and also not being adequately prepared as a, as a nation for, for a disaster of this, of this kind. Uh, natural da disaster preparedness budgets are not disposable. Uh, resources need to be in working condition when all is good. The time of the emergency is not the moment to scramble for a solution, which is what we're obviously doing. But as a country, we are good at that, and we're good at playing catch up, and I'm confident that we're going to get through this. Uh, financial literacy, people are going to have to understand uh, financial management better and get a stronger handle on their own finances, on their businesses. Uh, and of course, access to, to technology. Those folks who haven't stayed up with technology are clearly uh, not going to be a winner in this, in, in, in this crisis. Uh, PPP for small businesses to be prepared and what's pertinent here. Uh, I think the first thing is, is as a business, uh, we have to recognize that as much as we all were uh, first a brick and mortar business, we are now uh, going to be first an online business and that the brick and mortar aspect of our business may in fact be secondary 
to our business and that uh, more businesses are going to, by their very nature, be more virtual. And those that are more virtual will ultimately be more successful. The ability for a business to be able to continue to work in some way with people at home or at any new location is going to make them nimble and make them be a winner in, in this crisis. Those businesses that are hunkered down to a particular location at any point in time are those businesses that are going to have to figure out how to reinvent themselves. Um, in terms of what to do immediately, the first thing that you need to do is obviously you have to contact your creditors if they're folks that you owe money to, whether it's a landlord, a, lend, a, a lender, uh, whether it's a car payment, whether it's even a utility, uh, whether it's, it's a credit card, all those creditors are working with their borrowers and their clients because they know that without you, they don't exist. And they're all being, at this point in time, uh, for the most part, uh, working out solutions so that when you get back in business, you can make up your payments and you can get back on your feet. Now, there are always gonna be outliers, there are gonna be some landlords and some lenders that aren't gonna be helpful, and that's where your lawyers come in, that's where bankruptcy lawyers come in, that's where Zach Shulman, who's on the phone with us, who works with us very closely, uh, is, is with us. Uh, those are the types of situations we're gonna have to look at. But for the time being, do not be afraid to pick up that phone, do not be afraid to call us and have us assist you with this process. It is very important that you don't just let these bills pile up. Uh, and again, you should rethink your small business and, and make sure that your small business is not like the average American who is living week to week, month to month. The business to be successful must have a rainy day fund for any kind of crisis. Hopefully not a crisis that's a 100 or 500 year crisis, but, but any crisis that, that could pop up from year to year. Uh, we have some questions I think we're gonna go to. Um, okay, hi Roy, we received an email from the SBA this morning. Guess the SBA has decided to give applicants a, a $1,000 per employee instead of $10,000 grant, we were told. So far, we have not received anything but an email. Here's the quote. On March 29th, the following passage, okay, I'm not gonna read this whole thing, but, but it does sound like the SBA is working on the fly and they're changing uh, their programs as they go to try and make this thing fly. Um, so that is very good information and I appreciate it. How to protect securities from potential lawsuits? Not sure I understand that question. Um, if it's suggesting that you have uh, securities in the name of your company, uh, they're, they're an asset and, and they're just like any other uh, asset that could be available to, to pay your creditors. What is a vulture fund? A vulture fund is a fund that's put together to buy distressed assets. Whenever there's a downturn in the economy, uh, you have these kinds of funds that are put together for particular sectors. Last time around, these funds were created to buy distressed uh, family homes uh, that were in foreclosure, and that's what, what, what created a, a new type of, of, of of investment, and, and that is uh, residential homes that are owned by large investors that now rent them out. Before the last economic crisis, that sector of the economy did not really exist. Um, not really a question, but an observation on PPP. Big fintech companies like Intuit and PayPal are rolling out the PPP the next few days, probably doing so because of all the stories of Wells Fargo and the other banks not responding efficiently. More importantly, I doubt they get in this so late in the game. If there weren't money left available over, overheard, there's still about 100 billion that hasn't been allocated. Yeah, so there's a, probably about 100 billion that hasn't been allocated. There's probably another 250 billion that will get allocated, excuse me, that will come fresh. So that's 350. So they're thinking that they can jump in. And I don't think that this is the end of the game. So I think those people who have applied need to stay online, you don't wanna to get to the back of the line. And I, we do have some clients that we have helped and a few of them have been paid but the vast majority still have not. But, but we do know that the, the funds are flowing. We know that banks are hiring thousands and thousands of employees or, or, or contractors who are working double shifts right now, 24 hours a day to try and process. This is a wave, a tidal wave that no one has ever experienced, including the banks. And as much as we wanna make the banks the villains here, they are in this with us as much as they, because as, as much as us, because unlike the last crisis, no one can suggest that the banks in any way are the villains here and cause this crisis. This is a, a crisis, a, a natural catastrophe. It is not something that, that is man-made. Have you heard of anyone receiving the PPE payment? If so, what was roughly the amount and business profile? Uh, it's probably the PPP. Uh, and, and so far, we think that the average amount that people are receiving is around $159,000, $160,000. And there's an average that we just saw this morning. Do you want me to continue? Okay, next slide. Um, 
continuing what businesses must must do besides contacting your creditors they they should be contact they, they should be making sure that their supply chain is running uh well they should make sure that they have inventory to be able to produce products when people start to come out we have a number of clients that have pivoted from from product a to making a personal protection gear uh they're they're importing it from other parts of the world and um, that's the kind of stuff that that we are good at as a country and so you need to ask yourself what is in demand now not what product you're making that you're hoping people will want in the future the issue is that you should be uh anticipating what the needs are today and trying to fill those needs. There clearly there's a remarkable need for personal protection and, and there are folks out there that are sourcing, sourcing it from, from all over the world. Um, so you need to transform your market to remain relevant. And you, you, one of the things you ought to do, and, and this is, uh, we read this over the weekend, is just pick up the phone and start calling your clients, calling your vendors, seeing how they are, speaking to your referral sources and make sure that they're okay and see how you can help them in any way. And of course, we're doing that. And with these very series of seminars, we're, we're, we're doing that. Is there a question? Okay. Uh, next. Uh, as for individuals, similar uh, suggestions that we have for, for yourself as we do for small businesses, you need to contact your, your creditors. You can call even your, your power company. You can call your, 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 um, your, your phone company. You can call any of you, you, your utilities, your water company, and they've all created payment plans and allow you to, to skip a payment or to delay a payment until you're back on your feet. And so uh, you need to do that and not put your head in the sand here, but to actually reach out and they will be very supportive. Of course, credit card companies are doing all kinds of things too. And so we, we need for you to do that. And, and of course, we talked about contacting your landlords and of course, your mortgage company. Uh, the biggest mistake would be to ignore your bills and not be responsive. Same thing with medical bills. If you have some medical bills, call them and tell them that you'll take care of it when, 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 when you're back on your feet and you'll get some sort of dispensation. Um, stay healthy, safe, balanced, and relevant. Okay, these are very important tips. Uh, you should be, all be participating in various networking activities. There's all kinds of things online that relate to your industry, your hobbies, your, your, the things that you like, your religion, and, and you should make sure that you're, you're having those, those social contacts. Uh, you should try and keep a, a schedule and divide your personal time from your work time uh, so that even though if you're in the same space, you're making sure that there is a, a division between uh, your weekends, your week, your evenings, your morning, so it all doesn't become one big blur. Uh, and of course, professional advice, whether it's, it's psychological advice or legal advice or accounting advice, uh, it's important that, that you do that. Uh, all the, the professionals are working, they're all working remotely, like just like our firm is. And if you all have any questions uh, that come up from what we talk about today, we actually have special pricing for, uh, for folks who listen to our seminars so, so that we can, we can work with you all also and provide the services that, 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 you, that you need. Um, in terms of long-term goals, you have to, you know, keep them in mind, but be nimble and understand that this is one of the first times in all of our living lives that while we usually know what the future is going to look like, we can think what the future may look like, but we're not sure. We do know that this will end. We do know that it won't be exactly the same like what we're coming back to. We know that it's going to be somewhat dystopian. We know that it's going to be in some ways like, like a bad science fiction movie where you're being checked at checkpoints and that your civil liberties are, are, are being uh, somewhat balanced by the need to keep the greater society safe. And those are the kinds of issues that, that we're going to have to look at. So long-term goals, uh, we should keep them, but we also need to make sure that we're, that we're fulfilling short-term needs and balancing those two. And it's a really tough situation when none of us in our lives have ever had, had to do that. Okay. Uh, just as importantly, we have a, a COVID-19 section on our website, www.oppenheimlaw.com. It's right on the top, and if you're on your phone, it just pops up. And there, there's lots of resources, lots of web, lots of uh, links, both for unemployment, for all the loan programs that we're talking about today, and all the different questions that you may have, whether you're an employee, whether you're an employer, whether you're a 1099, whether you're a gig worker, all those things are on that site. and and it's very important that you understand where you are 
in the society. If you were an Uber driver, you're a gig worker, you're a 1099. What benefits can you apply for? Can you apply for unemployment? Yes. Can you apply for the PPP? Technically, yes. What is better for you? The answer to that is you need to speak to your lawyer and your accountant to figure that out. Uh, and again, I mentioned uh, for those of you who need our, our consultation, we are discounting our, our services to those people who've been supportive of, of our efforts here in our fifth week of, of doing Zoom at noon. You know, five weeks ago when we decided that we were going to do this, uh, many people thought that, that there was going to be no need and that, and that again, we were jumping the gun. And we were just looking at what was happening in, in China and of course our friends in Italy. And, and we thought that if this came here, we would need to provide the kinds of support and structure for, for all of us to get through this together. Keep your eyes open for solutions to new challenges. Be on the lookout for new ways uh, people are solving problems. Be open to try unorthodox solutions. I mean, it, it, at this point, we have to try different things and see what works. I mean, obviously, the medical community is doing that, trying to figure out if they, if they have found a, a cure, which they probably have not. They're working on, on, on a uh, vaccine. Uh, many people are working on a vaccine, and, and obviously, we're hopeful that that will come about. And then we're looking to see if we can transfer antibodies from people who've had it, who now are less likely to get it and how long those antibodies are going to be good for. And so the way society is gonna open up is, where, is when one of these three uh, 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 highways opens up to allow for us to feel comfortable socially being close to, in proximity to one another. Until that time, it's going to be very different. The flexible bend, the inflexible break, I believe that comes from a, uh, from some Chinese, from a, from a Chinese proverb actually, and that, and that those folks that are, that are able to bend, those houses and hurricanes that were able to, to withstand storms because they were made out of wood and actually were able to flex uh, the kinds of, of, uh, of wood that, 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 that bends, such as bamboo when it blows in the wind, they are, in, are flexible. The inflexible will ultimately break, and so we all want to be the kind of, of flexible bending type of material that, that can go with the wave and figure out how to survive. And so far, I think we've all done phenomenally well, and, and, we're, and we're very thankful that we've been able to help you all in, in this process. Uh, in terms of the future, I mean, there's, there's you know, we, we can look at virtual reality as, 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 as something, as can, can we proceed here? Uh, augmented reality, there, there are gonna be all kinds of, of things that the future is going to bring. I wanna talk about teleservices. Obviously, we're providing teleservices just like we are today. We're also providing uh, teleservices to our clients. Uh, and of course, uh, telemed has been phenomenal. I know many of you, we have friends who have used their doctors via telemed and, and the doctors are now allowed to bill via, via telemed. Uh, and in the past, actually, some were not. And so now they're starting to do that. And, and that's one of the reasons why uh, medical office space has become uh, so less significant in terms of value because doctors are realizing that they will, they will need a lot less space than they, than they have. One of the things we want to talk a little bit about, and this is where lawyers come in again, is to make sure you're not being scammed. Uh, we've seen so many scams in the past few weeks. What happens is when people get scared, they, they want to believe in something that, that may not be true. Uh, fear and anxiety obviously fuel scammers. Uh, more time online means more exposure to cyber crimes. Uh, remote workers offers access to potentially confidential information and data breaches, so we all have to be careful about that. Please don't let your guard down. Protect yourself, protect your client's information, protect your own personal information. Do not release your social security information uh, unless it's maybe over the phone and it's to someone that you're absolutely certain needs it. Um, and again, using licensed professionals is, is critical at this point in time. They're here to make sure that, that you are protected. Um, we have some websites here that, that we all want to, to go over. We have the SBA loan applications, uh, we have the uh, disaster relief applications, and we have the Florida unemployment application. Um, I think there's also a, a, a new Florida unemployment site that we have now on our uh, COVID-19 site on our website, and it may, may need to be updated. I know we have some questions. Let's see what we got here. Okay, I received the same email. Okay. Oh, someone else received the same email from the SBA. They'll give me $1,000 per employee uh, uh, and the business had in January. Okay. So that's, that's a new, uh, 
a new concept that, that they didn't previously say. Previously, they said they were giving businesses $10,000. Uh, someone else says, I've accepted a deferment payment from my mortgage company. Will this ruin my credit? I got a letter from my credit union saying that they may report uh, to credit bureaus. Uh, most banks are not, and I, I think that's something that you can always respond to and say it was part of COVID-19. And since so many people are going to be in the same boat, the credit agencies are going to have to reassess how they evaluate credit if, if anyone's going to make a loan to anyone. I think right now, uh, worrying about your credit score is less important than hanging on to enough money for your family to make sure that you can get through the, the next several weeks. I've tried to talk to a couple of credit cards. They are very reluctant to lower the interest rate as a help. No, they're not going to lower the interest rate. That, that they're not going to do. Uh, but what they will do is, is, is lower the monthly payment or, or allow you to defer a payment. Obviously, high interest credit cards is a disaster long term, but right now it may be your only lifeline. Are there any protections for multifamily landlords for foreclosures and such if tenants are not paying? Are there any protections for multifamily landlords uh, for foreclosures? Not sure what that means. So if you're a landlord, uh, Right now, you probably uh, are gonna have difficulty bringing a foreclosure in some states, uh, but of course you'd be bringing an eviction if you're a landlord, so I'm not sure uh, if we're talking about tenants here. So if we're talking about tenants, some evictions are gonna be difficult and, and you're gonna have to tread lightly, and so the best thing to do is to work something out with, with your tenants. Of course, that's different for uh, commercial tenants versus, versus uh, residential tenants. Did you know where self-employed individuals who don't own a company can apply for the PPP, do you know we're self-employed individuals? The answer is yes, you would have to go to your bank. And it sounds like if you don't have a bank, uh, then you would have to go to the, uh, to the SBA, to the website that, that we have uh, both at the end of this presentation, as well as the, uh, the, the, the URL that we have uh, on our website. With regard to the idle advance, it appears that a business must have employees. This was not listed initially as a criteria. It looks like a two-person company with no payroll is out of luck. Uh, under what is being explained today, that's what it sounds like. I mean, these, these programs were meant to give money to the employers to pay their employees. And, and what the SBA and, and the government is, is trying to make sure is last time around when they gave money to the banks to presumably use that money to help people with their mortgage payments and their underwater second mortgages, the money initially was not used for that, and then many times was used uh, to buy back stock, to pay bonuses, and for other uh, uh, purposes to further the, the bank and not help the economy. So because of that stigma that happened last time, the, the concern is that any money given to any businesses goes directly to the employees. And so if you don't have an employee uh, and you are a 1099, it sounds like under those circumstances, you would probably be best applying for unemployment. Next question. Here's uh, can a realtor qual? Okay. Uh, here's a business must. Okay, we read that that one. Can a realtor here? Okay, can a realtor qualify for the ten thousand dollar grant if they don't pay salaries to themselves? Well, if you'd asked me this question last week, and if you looked at our slides, we would have said yes because that's what we were being advised by the SBA. From what we're being told right now by. Uh, folks who actually are getting letters from the SBA and I have and, and someone sent me the letter and I'll have to read it very carefully It suggests that you are going to get up to ten thousand dollars if you have at least ten employees I don't know what happens if you have 20 employees. Does that mean you get twenty thousand? The answer is probably not because they're capping the idle at fifteen thousand dollars Okay, another one. I just heard from the SBA is changing the program uh, It's changing the program and no longer will be buying the ten thousand dollar grants. Okay. Well, there you have it They're not even providing the ten thousand dollar grants. So we're hearing lots of different information from different places. Even when we get on some SBA calls, we hear one thing, and, and the information that's being provided is, is regional information, and it's not necessarily information that, that we can take to the bank. And if we can, we can take it to the bank, but it doesn't take us anywhere. Can we apply for the PPP as an owner of a business without drawing a W-2 salary? Only salary of the business is the owner's. Only salary of the business is the owner's. Well, if you are taking a salary as an employee of your business, the answer is yes. Uh, if you're not, you still might be able to, but it will likely not be fully dischargeable and it may be a loan that has to be repaid back because you're only allowed to use that money to pay back uh, salaries, which are not 1099, but W-2 salaries, as well as a, a small portion of, uh, of, your, of your rent or, or your mortgage payments. So if you're, if you're not paying salaries and you're only paying yourself, you could probably get the loan, but it won't be dischargeable and you'll have to pay it back.
I also received another email from Wells Fargo telling me I'm still in line, but they have nothing to offer me at this time in regard to the PPP. Well, that sucks, okay? And that just, that's just not right. And uh, hopefully that will change or you will have to change banks. Um, maybe you know you need to go to Quicken Loans or, or whatever, but it, it's really unfortunate if a bank that you have a banking relationship with tells you that. And that's just really just not right. Will this, re will this be recorded to be listened to again? The answer is yes, they're all recorded, they're all transcribed, uh, and so you will be able to hear it. How long is it taking you to hear from unemployment once you file? The answer is I have no idea because as you saw virtually uh, no one today who has applied for unemployment has heard from them. And so um, what you need to do is you need to log on to the site and put in the appropriate uh, uh, information, maybe your social or whatever else you're, you're identified with and see what the status of your application is. And you ought to be doing that on a regular basis. From Zach here, Zach Schillman, in response to the question from multifamily landlord who may be subject to future foreclosures, because their tenants are not paying rent, uh, a Chapter 11 bankruptcy for the landlord under the new chapter, uh, under the new subchapter five, may be beneficial to reorganize a mortgage debt that they cannot pay right now, and that and that's excellent. Um, in fact, can we go? Can we go to Zach for a second? Zach, are you there? No, we can't. Okay. Anyway, so the answer, answer live? No. Okay. Uh, Zach, thank you. Yeah. So, so the answer is that you may have to file for some reorganization if, in fact, you're you're uh, having a problem with your landlord and excuse me, with your, with your bank because your tenants aren't paying it. And maybe the, the, the new uh, chapter five in sub chapter 11 would be a perfect, perfect answer for, for you. Um, I think we have a few more questions here. Uh, uh, SBA has been directed by the government to pay $10,000. Can they arbitrarily change the specifics of the government directive? It says $10,000. Okay, um, and the answer is they probably can't, but they're probably doing it. Okay, we're gonna go to Zach for a second. Can we? Zach, are you there? No, yep, here we are. Can't find Zach, okay. Uh, is there, here, there he is, Zach. Hello. Ah, Zach, thanks for joining us. So the answer, so can you repeat the question and then answer it a little bit more? Yeah, I can pull up, um, well, I, th I, I think that um, what the question from the um, multifamily landlord it seems that they are um, afraid, rightfully so, that if they have a lot of tenant-occupied um, tenant properties, that if the tenants aren't paying them and won't be paying them for some time, what's gonna happen to their mortgage uh, or mortgages on all those properties? And that's a very valid concern. Um, and, and what I responded in the Q&A was that is exactly the type of um, potential uh, bankruptcy that could help them. Whether, whether they own the properties individually or through a business, um, that's the exact type of situation that the new subchapter five, which we discussed a few weeks ago at um, prior um, Zoom at noon, uh, could be helpful. And, and, and by doing so, the, the, the goal would be to reorganize the mortgage debt, which could be done. So it could be reorganized in what? Changing the principal, changing the interest rate, extend, extending the payments out? Um, potentially all of the above. It, it, it's going to depend on what the value is of, of the properties uh, compared to the debt. Um, my, we, uh, you know, what might, what might uh, be able to be done is a reduction of the principal. Right. Um, what might be able to be done is an extension of um, the debt, maybe even um, changing the payment terms. So uh, let's talk a little bit about cram downs because that's what you're talking about here, right? Right. Yes. So, so just explain that a little bit, what that means for people who have, properties that are going to be underwater. Sure. Commercial yeah. properties, commercial properties. Commercial properties, right. Um, so commercial, commercial property in a chapter 11 bankruptcy, if the value of the property is worth less than the mortgage, then there is a possibility to reduce the mortgage down to the value of the property. We saw this gr a great deal um, back in the Great Recession when property values plummeted and we had people um, doing um, doing cram downs all the time. So commercial property would include a multifamily, a duplex, a triplex, a quadplex, right? It wouldn't just include, uh, you know, a, a, a mall or an office building. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So the you the only own... prohibition is is if the um, person, if it's a, if it's a if it's an individual bankruptcy, let's say a, a chapter thirteen or an individual chapter eleven, and an individual is filing and they want to cram down. The mortgage on their primary home, 
then that could be an issue. But there's exceptions and exceptions to the exceptions. What happens if you have a triplex and you live in one of those and then you, the other two are rented? Is that deemed commercial or is it residential or is it both? It's a good question. <laughs> um, I, I, I think that a situation like that, they would be able to, to cram down. Because we have a lot of people on the call today who own vacation rentals and those are all commercial properties and it seems to me whether they own it in their name individually or whether they own it in, in, in an LLC they should be able to file under that new uh, sub chapter 5 of, of, of the chapter 11 it seems to me absolutely that's right. that's the exact situation on what it was made for right and then if you have large hotel operators who whose places are shuttered they too should be able to be able to file a, chap, file a chapter 11 and, and be able, but not under sub five probably, to uh, reset their debt based on the new values of the properties. Right, right. And then if, if their total debt is less than $7.5 million uh, under the new provisions, they would be able to do a sub chapter five, which is the simpler way of doing a chapter right. 11. So if any, if any of you folks out there have these issues, you're welcome to call me. You can call Zach directly. It doesn't really matter. We're working together on, on these matters. And uh, we know there's going to be a lot of folks whose properties are going to be revalued downward based on the fact that, that the social distancing won't allow people to necessarily travel to Florida as frequently uh, with the middle seat being empty for a period of time. And, that, and by the way, that's what airplanes are doing right now. When they do fly, when they do fly, which means only 10% of their flights are flying, when those planes do fly, the middle seat is, is, is empty. And it's probably going to remain empty for an extended period of time. Uh, in fact, there were years ago, I remember the middle seat was always empty. And then all of a sudden they started cramming people in. And so we're, we're, we're kind of going to go back to where we were, where flying was maybe more expensive and, and, and we just didn't decide to just go somewhere. It was a big thing. And, and that middle seat's going to be empty, which means flights are going to be more expensive, but it also means less people are going to come down from vacation rentals. And when they do come down, they will come down for longer periods of time. They will come down, you know, maybe for the whole season and not just, just for a week. So, so the idea of spring break may disappear for a period of time because uh, this new social distancing just won't conform with, 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 with how spring break is, is currently organized and how, we, how people travel down for, for spring break. We have another question here. How long is it taking to hear from, no, we, I think we've done these. Is there, SBA has been directed, no, these are all, from the SBA, no, these are all, these are all, these are all the questions we've had. Um, are there any other questions? I just wanna make sure that we've, we've answered all the questions. Um, I've accepted a deferment payment from my mortgage company. No, okay. Can, uh, can a pretty revenue venture, can a pretty revenue venture access any government support? I don't know what that, that means. Um, anyway, Zach, any, any other ideas that you want to share with everyone before we cut out? Um, no, I, I, think, I think what you hit on earlier, contact your creditors, uh, try to work something out. And, and there's always options such as bankruptcy and and, and foreclosure defense and all these legal options that we're talking about is available down the road. But I, but I think it's just like you're explaining, exhaust all the options beforehand. Right. Uh, thank you. Uh, someone said our, our charts are fantastic. Well, I want to thank uh, uh, Paolo Vergara again and, and Lance Oppenheim for, for putting those together. It's, it's kind of a fun, fun thing to, uh, to, to decide which charts are, are of interest, but they are interesting to us, and we appreciate whoever just said that. Thank you. Uh, in many situations, loan forgiveness results is a tax liability for the forgiven amount. Do you know if that applies to PPP program? Uh, the answer is we are not sure, but it's likely uh, that it will not be considered income. Uh, but there are some questions about how that money will will hit the bottom line, uh, and so. Uh, Right now, I think people are just concerned about the existential threat of keeping their businesses going, but there could be some tax consequences, but I think that's going to get ironed out at the end. You also may have huge losses that you're going to offset anyway, and so if you have those losses, it, it may not be relevant to, uh, to that because you could use your losses to offset that, that, that income. Um, anyway, uh, Zach, anything else that you're seeing on the horizon? No, I think you covered, covered everything very, very well. Well, we appreciate everyone joining us today. Again, I just want to reiterate that you go to our website, www.oppenheimlaw.com. Uh, there's, a, there's a COVID-19 section that you can look at that should be a good resource. If you have any questions about uh, foreclosure or, or bankruptcy, you certainly can call Zach or ourselves. We also are offering special discounts right now to those of you who, who want to speak to us and have a consult for those of you who've participated in, 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 in this seminar. And so we'll see you again next Tuesday. Zoom at noon. Zach, thanks again. And everyone else, thank you for joining us. Have, have a great day.